I want to bring just some scriptural reflections. And uh, it would be very easy, of course, uh, turning to our Bibles to turn to those texts of comfort and hope and 23rd Psalm and such like. Um, but I think we need a bit of biblical realism as well. Uh, and one of my habits is to read through the book of Proverbs from time to time on the days of the month. And so yesterday being the 1st of June, I was reading from Proverbs chapter 1. And in Proverbs chapter 1, uh, I think the message that we get from wisdom is that we eat the fruit of our own folly when we ignore all God's warnings. Uh, Lady Wisdom, who speaks on behalf of God, says this in Proverbs chapter 1. You may think this is an unusual place to start. But it seemed to me, reading it, just to speak straight into the situation we're in in the world today. She says, but since you refuse to listen when I call and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm and disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you. And those are words which speak right in today, calamity, distress, disaster, trouble, uh, overwhelming us. But uh, do we think then that God is laughing? Is that what she's saying? Well, no, of course, those words are ironic, they're poetic. Uh, they're the kind of I told you so laugh of a father who laughs when a child speeds down the hill on a bike and crashes and says, I told you, I warned you. No, we know that God weeps for those who weep. And the prophets say that in all his affliction, God himself was afflicted. Uh, so God is suffering with those who are suffering. But nevertheless, part of the pain that God feels comes when he sees us as human beings simply ignoring his warnings and proceeding with our greed and our folly. Uh, and so wisdom again goes on like this uh, in the same passage, chapter one, since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord and spurned my rebuke and would not accept my advice, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. And I must remember when I read that, I thought, gosh, how absolutely perceptive of what is happening today. It's chilling, isn't it? Uh, the complacency of fools will destroy them. How much complacency we've seen uh, in recent weeks and how many world leaders, in a sense, have made fools of themselves uh, by ignoring the warnings that they got uh, with lethal bravado. But of course, it's not just in recent days that we've been ignoring those warnings. Uh, he here are some words from Tear Fund, which I think are absolutely right. And I quote that as hard as it is to hear, the outbreak of coronavirus is not a natural disaster. It's a disaster of own, our own making. Viruses jump species and get into humans and environmental destruction makes this more likely to happen as people are brought into closer contact with virus carrying wild animals. Deforestation, animal traffic, unsustainable farming are all likely factors at play. And, and so God has given us warnings over recent years, but as Proverbs says, you refuse to listen and don't, nobody pays attention. And so in the end, it feels that God says, as he did in Romans chapter one, that if we go on with our folly and our greed, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. So I think we need to recognize that there is something of um, the way in which God's judgment works out in response to human folly uh, in the way that Proverbs speaks of that. Second text I'd want to take you to is, again, perhaps unusual, but it's to Ezekiel chapter 27 and 28, where we read about the collapse of economic idols causing global grief and fear. Uh, the picture of Ezekiel 27 is uh, of a lament over the great trading city of Tyre. And it, it's really quite remarkable because the prophet lists all, presents Tyre like a great ship, a cargo ship. Uh, loaded with all the trade of the world. There's a whole manifest here of, of what they were trading in and what was on the ship uh, from all the nations of the world. It's, it's a kind of picture of global trade uh, on the great ship, the cargo ship of Tyre. Then it puts out to sea uh, uh, in verse 26, but the east wind breaks it to pieces and it sinks in the heart of the sea. There's a kind of a great shipwreck uh, of the whole economic system uh, that was based on tires trading. But the response to this is not the response that you get, for example, in Revelation uh, chapters 18 and 19, where you get the fall of Babylon, of course, reflecting a lot of what the Old Testament says about Tyre as well, uh, which is then greeted with hallelujahs. You know, the, the, the great tyrant is gone. Uh, and so the, the whole nations in creation rejoice. But in this chapter, as it were, within history, as opposed to the eschatological ending, when the big ship 
of world trade goes down, then what we read is that all those on the shore quake, they cry out in fear, they cry bitterly, they sprinkle dust on their heads. And so there's a, a, a reality that we have to recognize that the Bible shows that when the economic idols collapse and economic systems collapse, which seems to be very much what's beginning to happen in the world already in, in, in some parts, the collapse of economic systems, then there's great fear and grief and struggle. Uh, and, and we need to recognize that as the Bible does. It's not yet the hallelujah time, uh, it's the time of grief. And that brings me to the third scripture that I wanted to bring to you. Again, it's not a, a familiar one, but it's uh, the prophet Obadiah. Uh, and here we're thinking about the worst thing that ever happened in the history of Old Testament Israel, which was, of course, the destruction of Jerusalem uh, in 587 BC at the hand of the Babylonians. Uh, and what happened then was that not only was Jerusalem destroyed, but some of her enemies flooded in to take advantage of it. Uh, and my point here then, the third point I wanted to make, is that evil thrives as well as good. We've seen lots of good things happening in, in the midst of all of this. So much that has come out both from Christians, but also from non-Christians made in the image of God. Yes, lots of good things, but evil thrives and the wicked take advantage in times of calamity. Uh, and so we see the way Obadiah condemns the Edomites uh, in, 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 uh, in Obadiah. And he says that they had shown violence against your brother Jacob. You should not gloat over your brother. You should not rejoice. You should not boast. You should not go through their gates and seize their wealth in the day of disaster. The Edomites took economic advantage out of the suffering and pain of Jerusalem. And again, that's what we're seeing uh, in, in this terrible times, that uh, evil surfaces, not only the, the, the surfacing of things like racism and xenophobia and hatred and stereotyping and blame and the increasing power of authoritarian governments and all of that that I'm sure Melville will be talking about later, but also uh, disaster capitalists who see in this whole thing an, an opportunity uh, to increase their wealth, uh, and to consolidate the power of their wealth at the hands of the poor and so on. So uh, the Bible again recognizes that in times of disaster and calamity, it's not only an opportunity for good, but very much an opportunity for evil as well. And missiologically, we need to reflect upon that, uh, that we have a radical analysis of sin uh, and of the evils that are in human hearts. Uh, and we will see people who are making a killing out for themselves, out of the suffering and pain of others. Um, that's the way it is today. It's even the way it was back in the times of Obadiah. My fourth uh, biblical reflection comes from, again, uh, a source that, well, perhaps some of us are thinking about, the Book of Lamentations. We've been preaching through Lamentations at All Souls Church in Langham Place uh, in recent weeks. Uh, and here, uh, I've already referred to 587, of course, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, and the point about that is that, yes, it was great suffering. It was also, of course, God's judgment. Uh, and Lamentations accepts that and recognizes that uh, after centuries of warnings uh, and pleading with the people to change their ways, in the end, God's judgment had fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. And their folly, their political folly, had led to the wrath of Babylon falling upon them. And through the wrath of Babylon, the, man, the ministry, as it were, of, of the judgment of God. And so if we ask about this issue of this pandemic, is it God's judgment? I'm always very cautious in how to answer that question. Uh, because at one level, going back to our first point, yes, I would see that, uh, in a sense, within God's creation, God has warned us that if we treat his creation so badly, then creation itself will fight back. There are moral principles at work within the created order. And in some ways, what is happening is a, an outworking of God's judgment against human sin and folly in the created order. But one has to be careful to say, well, that doesn't mean that everybody who's suffering or who's died, who's lost their job, is there for, as it were, being directly hit by God for their sin. We, we need to avoid those kind of simplistic answers to the questions of God's judgment. Um, and I would do that. But even in the book of Lamentations, even though there's an acceptance that what has happened is somehow under the judgment of God, they, 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 they lament and they protest because it, it seems so disproportionate. Uh, and what the book holds up before us is the suffering of the poor and the needy and, and also especially the children, the mothers of the children who are dying in the streets. And they're saying to God, all right, God, we accept we sin, but isn't this too much? 
Uh, and so there's, there's a sense in which a, a, a proper biblical missional response to all of this needs to focus with books like Lamentations, like Job, like some of the Psalms, on the validity of lament and protest before God, that God allows this, God provides words for it uh, in, in Lamentations. Uh, and not only that, but in the book of Lamentations and indeed in Jeremiah, we see that when the calamity hits, then false prophets were exposed for the charlatans that they were. Uh, they had tried to bring comfort to the nations, peace, peace when there is no peace. But now in the day of calamity, they've got no comfort to bring at all. And I just wonder whether or not, uh, from a missional point of view, this whole uh, pandemic will have any impact on the uh, credibility of the prosperity gospel, uh, the false prophets, the preachers of all sorts of Christian conspiracy theories and everything else, that whether false prophecy will be exposed for what it is uh, as uh, charlatan. And my fourth thought, though, is more positive, it comes from Jeremiah chapter 29, where we read that in the wake of this judgment of God that had fallen on the city and the people were taken off into exile under God's judgment, the Abrahamic mission didn't stop. Uh, so in his letter to the exiles in Jeremiah, do you remember, God gives them a a clear new perspective on their situation that what had happened to them was under God's control. Uh, God had not left them. Um, and so the, the, the sovereignty of God, in a sense, is still there, even in those awful traumatic circumstances. Um, but in that circumstance, then Jeremiah tells them, so seek the welfare, the shalom of the city where God has put you and pray to the Lord for it. In other words, be a blessing where you are. Uh, you're among your enemies but you're still to be Abraham in that context, to be a blessing to the nation. Uh, and so it seems to me that the opportunity for the church to be doing good in this situation is enormous. And already I'm sure people have got stories of that. Um, but there we have it in Acts chapter 11, of course, that when uh, the church in Antioch heard about the famine that was coming, they got together and they sent the relief to the city of Jerusalem through the hands of Saul and Barnabas. That was Paul's first missionary journey, by the way. Paul's first missionary journey was for famine relief, not for evangelism in chapter 30, but to go to Jerusalem with the, uh, the relief for the famine. And then Paul remembers that in Titus, when seven times, seven times in the little book of Titus, he talks about how Christians are to be those who are eager to do good, doers of good. Uh, even in a situation that they find themselves in. So those are a few biblical reflections. I did say a few, um, because obviously there's lots more places one could go, but I thought perhaps we need to go to some unusual, unexpected places to think through uh, this, this issue biblically.